Good evening, everyone. Please start taking your seats. The event is about to start. Welcome everyone, thank you all for being here today. My name is Raquel Aceo, and I'm a fifth year student of the dual degree in international relations and law. And my name is Sam Ferdinand, and I'm in my second year of the dual degree in international relations and business. We're delighted to be your masters of ceremonies at this unique event. Persian poet and scholar Rumi once said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. When I started the degree five years ago, I was very much an idealist that wanted to change the world. But in the past couple of years, the events that we have witnessed make us think that this new world order is more like a new world disorder. <laughs> Sam, you started your degree in the context of this uncertainty, right? Indeed, I started my degree in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And uh, I mean, I would say that my love for global affairs is from way earlier. Being British and Spanish, the 2016 Brexit referendum was a big event in my life. And since then, I've been fascinated by how international relations can influence day-to-day -day life. And who would have thought that we would get the opportunity of learning and working directly with professionals from the United Nations, the European Union, and many other international organizations? We have the pleasure of sharing this stage today with some of those professionals. Josep Borrell, Augusto López Claros, Jody Williams, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, and Susana Malcorra. The diversity of their experiences reflects the need for multidisciplinary solutions to complex global challenges. That's, the re that's one of the reasons for the symbolic change in our school's name. The IE School of Global and Public Affairs has today become the IE School of Politics, Economics, and Global Affairs. To kick off this new era, please, let's just sit back and look back at the year and what it's meant for all of us by watching this video that the marketing team has prepared for us. Thank you. Wow, it is so fascinating to see students from all over the world coming together here at IE to lead these sort of initiatives. Many of these opportunities would not have been possible without the hard work and dedication of our school's dean and IE University Provost, Mr. Manuel Muñiz. Please join us in welcoming him on stage. Well, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction and very good morning to everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Um, it's wonderful to be here finally after a, a lot of work that has gone not just into this event, but uh, the, the many things that are announced today, including our change of name and a few other things that I'll mention in a minute. I wanted to thank our two MCs. So thank you, Raquel and Sam, for volunteering for this. Uh, they're two brilliant undergraduate students of ours. So if you could give them a round of applause, because I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, dear Vice President of the European Commission, dear Josep, dear former President uh, of the UN General Assembly, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, querida Susana, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Jody Williams, Professor Williams, Chair of the Global Governance Forum, querido Augusto, ambassadors, 
representatives of the European Commission and of the Spanish government, uh, queridos Nacho and Karma, uh, corporate and academic partners, faculty members, students, and a very, very uh, special welcome and thank you to Diego del Alcázar, our CEO, who's seated here. I'm sure he's uh, hating what I'm doing right now, but thank you for being here and for what it means that you're here and for all of the support that this institution has given all of us and has given this school. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for that, so thank you. We just saw a very shocking uh, clip that captured the many, many challenges that we face in the world today, from the fight against climate change and environmental degradation, to war in Europe for the first time since the end of the Second World War, uh, to the rise of authoritarianism around the world and the weakening of liberal democracy, to the fight against COVID uh, and other health uh, crises. Some of these challenges are truly existential. Uh, and as the video indicated, many of us, and I count myself in that group, sometimes feel truly overwhelmed at times by the sheer number and the scale of these challenges. Sometimes it is simply uh, just too much. It feels as if our security architecture was crum crumbling, our planet was dying, and our societies were struggling to remain cohesive. Will outright military aggression become the norm in Europe after what we've witnessed in Ukraine? Are we irrevoc irrevocably headed towards a sixth mass extinction, the loss of biodiversity and the destruction of habitats uh, around the world? Is this our legacy to the next generation, to our children, to our grandchildren? Is our world going to become more authoritarian, less democratic, as some studies seem to show? Will we fail at the governance of emerging technologies? These are immense, immense uh, questions, very important ones. But I want to begin this event today by pointing out that they remain exclusively that. They are questions, open questions. The answers are still to be provided. And many, many of the answers to these questions will be provided by people like the one, uh, folks like the ones that are seat, uh, sitting here today. So let me try to provide an explanation of why we're here, of what connects us, uh, all of us, uh, in this room. Uh, the truth is that all of the people in this room are in one way or another in the business of tackling global problems. At this institution, as the video said, we train the next generation of leaders willing to dedicate their lives to addressing all the challenges that I just enumerated, and many, many, many more. We do so uh, in a way that aims to address three fundamental forces that are shaping global politics. Let me go one by one. The first force is velocity. The world is changing exponentially around us. Sometimes it's hard to fully grasp what this means, but let me give you two examples. In the last 24 months, we created, we generated more data than in the past 20,000 years. I can give you another example, which I'm sure many of you have now tested and experimented with, with his chat GPT. The implications of applied AI uh, in the way we run our universities, our business, and our lives is going to be immense. These are two examples of exponential change. What does this mean for the academic world? Well, velocity calls for foresight. We need to be much better at looking at the future, trying to draw scenarios and understand what is to come. It also calls for reskilling, retooling, and updating our knowledge, which is something we aim to do here. It also calls for a much better understanding of the impact of technology in society. We have a wonderful center in this institution called the Center for the Governance of Change that works precisely on the governance of emerging technologies. Let me mention a second force. The second force is interdependence. What happens today in the Amazon basin, or what happens in Wuhan, uh, or what happens in Silicon Valley affects almost anybody and everybody uh, on Earth. And at the same time, that interdependence is coming apart as we speak. What does this mean for universities? Well, it means we need to educate individuals with a global mindset. Uh, I, 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 cannot, I, I do not know the number of nationalities represented in this room, but I'm certain it's well above the 100. It doesn't really get more cosmopolitan and global. Uh, than this. Interdependence also calls for an interdisciplinary approach, a systems thinking. Most of the challenges we face are immensely complex. That's one of the reasons, in fact, where we're announcing today this change of name. And uh, one of the words that you'll see in our name is economics that wasn't there in the past. And we bring together the disciplines of political science, economics, and international affairs for a reason. 
And that's because in order to understand the problems and address the challenges we face, you need an interdisciplinary approach in the world uh, today. Today we also announced, and I'm happy to share this with you, the launch of a new center at this institution, the IE Center for Innovation in Global Politics and Economics, that will produce applied research in these fields, and in fact it's going to be directed by our colleague Lara Thompson. I cannot see, Lara is right here. Uh, and I'm very happy to announce that. Lara was the deputy director of the International Organization for Migration in Geneva until not too long ago. We're very fortunate to have her uh, lead this project uh, to address these issues. The third and final force trend I wanted to mention is fragility. The world is increasingly volatile with an order, international order that is changing and becoming openly more illiberal, not just in its external configuration with the rise of illiberal powers around the world, but also within uh, liberal democracies. So there is a process of weakening of democracies from within. This is the world we inhabit one of the challenges we need to face. So what can be done from universities about this? And let me mention just one thing. The list could be very long, but I want to mention just the one thing. And that is we can foster, praise, and celebrate a sense of public service. And by public service, I do not mean working in government or for the public sector. I mean working to address common challenges. This can be done from the corporate world, it can be done from civil society, it can be done from governments, it can be done from NGOs. So much, trust me, so much of a life well lived is about working with and for others. And we can do that and we can convey that to our students. And let me share another idea because those of you that are fortunate enough to be in this room and to be in this institution as students and as partners of this institution have a great responsibility because with opportunity comes humility and responsibility. Today is a celebration of this ethos. I am about to give way to the real protagonists uh, of the day, uh, our speakers, our keynote speakers. In particular, I'm going to give way to Josep Borrell, the EU's top diplomat, uh, a man that I am fortunate enough to be able to call my friend. He's been a good friend for quite some time. He, his life is one that has been dedicated to public service over the decades. He's here today with us. Tomorrow he'll be in the Balkans, the following day in the Sahel, maybe a few days later in Eastern Europe or in Ukraine, working to address collective challenges. This is what we are about in this school. After him, we have four wonderful speakers. In Jody, in Susana, Maria Fernanda, and Augusto, all of them have dedicated their lives in one way or another to the service of others, in government, through political activism, in the multilateral world, or in academia. People like them are also in our faculty, and they will guide you through your studies. They will show you and teach you that dedicating your life to solving common problems is possible, and that you can do extraordinary things. Their own experience is living proof that this is possible. Now, I want to end by thanking all the people that have made this possible that have made this event, but above all, that make this school and this academic project possible. There are just too many to cite. I can see their faces. They're distributed around the room. But they know, they know who they are. And I say it uh, from the bottom of my heart. With, a, with their work, they make the world just a little bit better. Indeed, with our work, all of us, we help change the people that change the world and that they change it for the better. Now, I want to leave you with that message, with the power of academia, to change the world, and with the many resources, we have to address the challenges in the video that I've just cited. We are not helpless in the face of these challenges. We do not need to feel overwhelmed uh, or unable to address this. We can train climate leaders or people that would gear our corporate sector in the right direction. We can fight for open and diverse societies. We are very much, my friends, in the resistance to a closed authoritarian and repressive world. We can govern technologies in a way that fosters democracy. We can do all of these things and we can do more. And today is a celebration of those values and aspirations. So thank you, everybody, once again. Thank you for being here, and I hope you have a wonderful time. As, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for the warm welcome and the interesting reflections. 
Uh, as Manuel already anticipated, our next speaker is someone who has played a key role in European affairs and consolidating the European Union's position as a global player. His journey is beyond inspiring. He was State Secretary for the Treasury in Spain when Spain was negotiating its accession to the European Union in 1986. And since then, he has been in numerous ministerial positions. In 2004, he stepped into the leadership in the European Union, becoming the President of the European Parliament. In 2018, he became Spanish, uh, Spain's foreign minister, and uh, then in 2019, he became the European Union's uh, high representative for foreign affairs and security policy, as well as, of course, vice president of the European Commission. Please join us with a big round of applause for Mr. Josep Borrell. Do you want to click or... Buenos dias, good morning, bonjour. That's impressive. The first thing I have to do is to congratulate uh, the EA for this extraordinary success story. To congratulate... Uh, they gone? Oh, no. To congratulate you, Manuel, to congratulate you, Diego del Alcázar, and your father, please tell him how impressive I am. I know the EA from many, many years ago. And the development and the growth of this center is really astonishing. Spain is very proud of it. And we hope that this center will contribute to the formation of the new elites and also to make Spain better known in the world. So thank you for inviting me and congratulations for this extraordinary success. Well, I have to salute uh, all people here, ambassadors, uh, Secretary of State, uh, as we say in Brussels, two protocol observe for not uh, saying a long list of people and not forgetting anyone. But the most important ones are you, the faculty, and the students who honor me by your presence and attention. I've been, I've been, I've been asked to say some words about uh, the world geoeconomics. Geoeconomics or geopolitics, both things go together. Today, it's impossible to talk about politics without talking about economics and vice versa. And uh, the word geopolitics is very much fashionable. In Brussels, everybody is, is willing to be geopolitical. Geopolitical is a key word. Geoeconomics is less used, but more and more, we have to talk about the geoeconomic consequences of everything and how economics influences everything, and in particular, politics. So let's, let's try to, to tell you what I am going to talk about. I think that there are the, the most urgent things. The most urgent things is the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine dominates everything. It's impossible to talk without mentioning it especially for me, because I will never forget when uh, at five o'clock in the morning, on the 24th of February, my phone rang and a voice from the crisis center told me, I rep, they are bombing Kiev. And then I understood that the history has changed, that the new page of the history was open. I rep, they are bombing Kiev. One year later, they are still bombing Kiev. So this event has, changing, has changed Europe, has sent shock waves to the whole world in terms of high prices of energy and food, has mobilized the European Union resources. We have allocated to Ukraine since this morning almost 50 billion 
euros, military, financially, economically, humanitarian, almost 50 billion euros, so the bill is uh, high, but much more for the Ukrainians, who are losing a lot of people and being its country being destroyed. We have to be sure that Ukraine will prevail, but Ukraine is not the only danger. Our neighborhood is in flames, crisis in Moldova, and Serbia, Kosovo, Syria, Libya. Have a look at the speech of the Secretary General of the United Nations a couple of days ago, explaining the problems of the world in which we live. From the gender apartheid in Afghanistan, to massacres around the world, and ending, ending crisis, ending crisis in our immediate neighborhood. I spend most of my time talking with the Balkans, Serbia, Kosovo, in order to, to try to make peace or avoid war. The second big issue is the US-China strategic competition. This will define our world on trade and technology and on security. This is the most important driving force of the history. The third one is the, is the fact, uh, the fourth one is the fact that everything is being weaponized. I am the high representative for foreign policy, security, and defense. And what I can tell you is everything has become an arm. Migration, energy, data, investment, everything has become an instrument of power. And when we talk about hard power, we don't talk only about uh, throwing bombs, not only about military. You can have hard power by many other means. The last one is the, the crisis of the multilateral system. Power politics is the, the, the fact of the day, power, power. In the United Nations, there are less agreements and many more vetoes, and the United Nations Security Council, the G20, the WTO, has been either distrust or frozen. So let's go uh, a little bit deeper to any one of these issues, if I can. I will not have time to cover everything, but let's send to you some flashes. Let's start by unavoidably energy. We want to talk about energy, technology, and economy. Starting with energy, the most striking thing today is the massive rise in the price of energy, as you can see. It didn't start with the war, but uh, the war has made it much worse. The share of the GDP spent on energy by the, uh, in the world has been passing to skyrocketing, as you can see there. But now, quickly, it's going down. It's going down, and due to a lot of facts, a crisis was triggered in Europe and beyond. But remember one thing, the price of energy is the price of freedom. We pay it in euros, Ukrainians are paying it with blood. What we had was an excessive dependency on Russian gas. Look at this count. Overall, 40%, 40% of our gas, our, I mean Europe, was coming from Russia. For some member states, like Hungary, it was 100%. For Germany, almost 60%. And we learned that uh, the strategic intentions of suppliers and the nature of the regime of the country that supplies you matters a lot. But we have been very naive because after the invasion of Crimea in 2014, we continued increasing our dependency on Russian gas. And we even built new pipelines, Nord Streams, in order to bring more Russian gas. So then the war came, 
And we decided to get rid of this dependency. And we managed to do that in a very short time. Look at that. Before the war, Germany, gas 55%, coal 50%, oil 30% coming from Russia. Today, gas 0%, coal 0%, oil 0%. That's really remarkable. In a few months, to cut such a strong dependency. Germany today doesn't use a single unit of energy coming from Russia. And by the end of the year, all European countries will have cut all dependencies on Russia. Maybe Hungary will become an exception for political reasons and also because it's a landlocked country being supplied almost exclusively by Russia. Gas was our Achilles heel. Also because the price of gas is very much linked to the price of electricity. So look at the price of gas in July and August. 350 euros megawatt hour of gas. Do you know how many megawatts hour of gas you need to produce a megawatt hour of electricity? You know it? Well, two. You need two megawatts hour of gas to produce one megawatt hour of electricity. So when you say 350 gas, it means 700 megawatt hour of electricity. This was the peak in August. Everybody was scared. Oh my God, where are we going to go with electricity at 700 megawatts hour? It was a febrile uh, answer of the speculation in the markets from the beginning of the war to August. And then look at that. We are again at 55 euros megawatt hour. The same price that before the war. So what happened for this escalation is, and this going down? There are many reasons, and I would like to go to, to some of them. But the other graph, it's a, a shorter one. The blue line below is the price of gas in US. Can you see the difference? What do you mean that for the competitivity of our firms with respect to the American firms? When we were at 300, they were at 30. 10 times less. It's very difficult to compete if the energy input is 10 times more expensive. But this is really remarkable what has happened. What will happen? I don't know. But the important thing to notice is that we have got rid of the Russian dependency. Next slide, please. This is the story of oil. The blue is the Russian oil. The red is the North Sea oil. The Russian oil is becoming less and less expensive due to our cap and due to the fact that the sanctions are being effective. Today, and this is a little bit old as figure, today the Russian oil is being sold at 40, 40 euros barrel twice, uh, half, sorry, half of the North Sea. And who is going Russian oil? Well, they are friends, India and China. It's not a complete global market for Russian oil. The cap on oil and the cap on gas, hard power, has been very important in order to decrease the revenues of Russia. Here you can see how the Russian revenues has been decreasing due to the war. In September, November, it was about 800. It will be more or less 300, from 800 to 300. Uh, there you can see, I cannot go in detail, but please have a look at that later. You can see the reasons why the income of Russia selling its energy will decrease from almost 800 to 300. 
will, but it has already happened, because now it's at 640. And there you have the reasons, the political reasons, the geoeconomic reasons, why we will manage to decrease the financial capability of Russia to continue wedging the war. This is very important. Nobody can resist to have their revenues being cut from 800 to 300. I cannot go in detail for the reason it happens, but it's important to study one by one. This is the way that our sanctions has been affecting the Russian economy. People say, well, sanctions are not effective. The war continues. Well, yes, the war continues because the, the sanctions has not a medical effect overnight, but the Russian economy will pay a very high price for this war. Look, uh, the Western companies who left Russia represent more or less 40% of its GMP. And there you can see how the Russian exports and imports has been changing from 2021 to 2022. And, and the following one shows, no, the following one is another thing. But there you can see inflation, private consumption, Russia will pay a heavy price for it. Let me put just one example, a practical example. Most of the gas fields of the Russian Federation are on the depletion mode. They will be exhausted. They have a lot, but in deep waters in the Arctic, they don't have the technology to exploit these fields. If they want to exploit the new field gas, they need Western technology. And by the time being, they have not it, and they will not have it under the circumstances, it changed a lot. Then, let's have a look at the energy picture of the world. And here, one thing is striking, and should strike you. The world needs much more energy. To say that we will fight climate change by reducing Energy consumption is not, is not true. This is uh, the picture today, 2022, and until 2026, this is the prospects of the amount of new energy consumption in the world. So the solution will not come by using less energy. Well, maybe for us. We use a lot of energy. But in Africa, there are 600 million people that they have never seen an electric bubble. 600 million people that they don't know what is electricity. And 40% of the humankind, 40% has never used internet. So if we want people to increase their level of well-being, we need to spend much more energy. The question is, where this energy is going to come from. And on the other slide, you see where the energy has coming from since, the, let's say, the 65, the big expansion of the world economy. It, that's impressive. It's oil, it's coal, and it's gas who are still providing the bulk of the energy in the world. Yes, renewables have been increasing a lot, but what does it mean, a lot? Look, the role of the renewables, very low with respect to the consumption of gas, coal, and oil. Dirty energy, or carbon energy, has been increasing from 20 terawatts hour, 20,000 terawatt hours, to 50, thousand terawatts hours. Yes, you fight against climate change? Yes. Do we decrease the part of the carbon energy? No. The part of carbon energy remains today the same than 40 years ago or 60 years ago. More renewables, but much more, much more CO2 being produced by our energy expansion. What does it mean that? 
that we have to push much more for renewables, but much, much, much more. And certainly it is the only way of stopping the consumption of gas, coal, and oil. The problem is that uh, many poor countries have a lot of coal, some have gas, others some have oil, and they don't have the financial resources to develop other sources of energy. So keep that in mind. The future of the climate and our future will be determined by the poor part of humankind, by the poorest people in the world. The way they will develop in order to become less poor will determine our future. We Europeans, today, we represent only 8% of the world emissions. 8%. So if even tomorrow, by miracle, we stop producing a single gram of CO2, the problem will remain the same because it will be still 92% to be reduced. And who will, who will be reducing it? The others. Uh, among the others are the poorest. And the poorest have a, a more urgent problem to solve, is their subsistence. So we have in front of us an extraordinary problem of global justice. Who is going to pay the price in order to avoid that the expansion of the energy consumption of the less developed part of the world is not being done against climate? This is one of the most important geoeconomic and geopolitics of our time. So let's go to the second issue. It's the technological fight between US and China. Have a look at this graph. On blue, the world capitalization of digital companies from US. On red, the Chinese. Where are the Europeans? Where are the Europeans, Steve? The very small one, the light blue, the big one is the Americans. They're not as big, but quite big, are uh, the Chinese. And in this world, U.S. is very much worried by the technological development of China. It's a battle for supremacy. China is rising fast. They want to do still faster. And the U.S. has to start taking measures in order to prevent this growth. And there you can see the number of Chinese entities that U.S. has put on an export blacklist. By sector. Blacklist means that it is forbidden to export to these companies. Well, in 2012, nothing happened. Even in 2018, nothing happened. But now look on the sectors of technology, surveillance, telecommunications, the number of Chinese firms that the U.S. has decided to ban from the possibility of receiving exports. It has become a national security strategy. The US talk about the decisive decade in front of us. And in 10 years, they want to prevent China from becoming the number one in technology. This will require to accelerate the domestic innovation. And this will require also to increase subsidies. Remember what happened with Huawei? Now, the next battle is about uh, microchips, not only for military purposes, but for anything. Understand me well, they don't want to destroy Chinese. They need China. The coupling, nobody wants to decouple from China, and it would be impossible anyway. But uh, they want to try to control the supremacy that China could have if the current trend on technological development continues. Cooperation with China will, will continue, but it will be controlled. And on this fight, look at these concrete names. Ah.
Something is wrong. Okay. I was saying that on, on, on this fight, look at very concrete names. Some of them, maybe no one of you knows. Because there are four non-US companies, four non-US companies that are on the rise and will be decisive on this fight. TSMM, Taiwan, SML, Netherlands, the only European one, Baidi, China, and Katlu in China. Who are they? Who are they? Well, all of them are in the business of chips and batteries. And remember that uh, the more precise the chips are, the greater is the concentration of its production. And today, who produces chips for the whole world? Taiwan and South Korea. Taiwan and South Korea dominate the market. This is the size of the chips. This, this Lima one. The, this Lima one is TSMC and Samsung. The two of them produce almost 100% of the smaller chips in the world. While other chips um, with less nanometers with more nanometers are being produced by others, but the most effective, the most modern chips are being produced only, almost only, by these two firms. And there you can see the same thing, more or less. Look Europe. Look Europe. The blue one. Look Taiwan. US is trying to make an effort and increase but very far away from Taiwan, or South Korea, and Japan. If you look at the, at the cake, TSMC, only TSMC and others from Taiwan represent such a big part. If you add Samsung, you will see that China is only 6%, and others, all others, including us, it's 30%. So that's why in Europe we have just approved the CHIPS Act in order to develop our chip capacity production. But there are other actors. Tesla, this is Tesla, and this is BID, a Chinese firm, which are competing for battery electric and hybrid cars. BID is not as well known as Tesla, but it is as much important. And then you have SML, our company, who is having a lot of problems because the US want the Dutch government to prevent exports from SML to Taiwan or to China, to China. And keep in mind one thing. ASML produces the machines to produce the chips. But the production of chips is in Taiwan, but with machines produced by ASML. So it's not true that we don't master the technology. We don't have the mass production. But ASML produces the tools to produce. The production has been developed in Taiwan, but using ASML machines. And there is a big political fight about can ASML sell their machines to China? The US wants the Dutch government from preventing it from happening. But certainly there is a certain reluctance or resistance to do so. How are these machines? Well, this is a, the most advanced ASML machine to produce the smaller ships. It costs 160 million euros. It weighs 180 tons, and you need three Boeing 747 to transport it. So it's not a small machine. It's not a cheap machine. It's not an easy thing. Who do it? We, the Europeans. Who use it? The Taiwanese. And the Chinese would like also to have it. But the Americans doesn't want the Dutch to provide with this very important element. So here's the fight, you see. Here's the fight. Look, mining, 
processing, material production, and technology. You mine, you produce, and you use the final technology. Who is doing that? At the end, on batteries and solar PV, the orange one is China. China is everywhere, but especially on the technology manufacturing. Can you imagine? 80% of all solar cells in the world is being produced in China. 80% of all batteries is being produced in China. 70% of the wind, of the heat pumps, of the electrolysis. Who is producing cobalt? Mining in Congo. Mineral processing in China. Lithium in China. Aluminium is steel in China. The gray is the rest of the world. Is this because we don't know how to do it? Yes, we know. But it was so less expensive to do that in China that we did the same thing. And let me say one thing important. Today, our technological dependency on China is bigger than our energy dependency on Russia. We are more dependent on China on technology than we were dependent on Russia on energy. And it's not going to be so easy to get rid of, the, of this dependency. So I don't want to go deep on that, but uh, I want just to make a seminar work for you to think about. And the last uh, idea is about uh, the economy on itself. We are living in a global slowdown. The latest figures of the World Bank says that the world will only grow 1.7%. Only 1.7%. China will be on the lowest growth rate of their modern history, maybe not even 3%. And this represents something important for a country where the authoritarian power rely mainly on their capacity to increase the well-being of the people. And, and, and we have a problem of a slowdown of the economy and increase on inflation. Inflation is going down very quickly, but we don't know what's going to happen with the growth. The inflation reached high peaks, almost 160% in poor countries like uh, uh, Sudan or uh, South Africa people, or in, because they were very much dependent on the food coming from Ukraine, and the war stopped the flow of food and they suffer a lot from high levels of inflation. Now it seems that things are going better, but uh, there is a big question mark about how inflation and growth will go. By the time being, not very well. The answer of the central banks has been a high increase on interest rate. The interest rates uh, have been increasing because the central bank have acted in a determined manner with unprecedented monetary tightening. And the Reserve, Federal Reserve has been leading that. This has made a big increase on in the dollars. We have been seeing a surge of the dollar. And this has represented a lot of problems for developing countries to service their debt denominated in dollar. As you see, it is the biggest action of the central banks altogether increasing interest rate. And the increase in the dollar has created a lot of problems, especially for developing countries, who were very hard hit by the pandemic, by the war, and now by rising interest rates. Many will have difficulties to access to capital markets. We face the risk of debt crisis. Sri Lanka was the first. It will not be the last. We see an increase on inequality, on poverty reduction, and on the development goals. 
Here you can see how the slowdown has been hitting especially the less developed countries. And the prospect for them is to face a debt crisis. And in any case, a reduction of the fight against poverty. There you see how the progress in poverty reduction has been stalled. These are bad news for the world because this world is very much unequal and the consequences of the war and the consequences of the reaction in front of the war, inflation plus interest rate has low growth, higher inflation, will create a lot of problems for the weakest part of the humankind. This is uh, the lenders. And what do you see? Who has become the great lender? Once again, China. The big blue zone. In, at the beginning of the century, China was not an operator on the debt market. And now it has the biggest part of the debt. And China is not part of the Club of Paris. So there are bilateral agreements. How China will react in front of a new debt crisis? Being as it is, the biggest lender in the world. China has just become the banker of the world. How they will react if there is a new debt crisis? This is another geoeconomic question that you have to take into consideration. Here you can see the proportion of poor countries who are at the risk of uh, the stress. But for me, it's more important the fact that China will be confronting a new situation. It's uh, a situation that we Western people, we are used, is the fact that uh, you give loans and people are unable to pay back these loans. Well, this is more or less what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I think that uh, we, we Europeans, we have to have a clear idea of our size. At the beginning of the century, we were 25% of the GDP. Sorry, we were 35% of the GDP. And now we have decreased to 25% of the GDP. From the point of view of market capitalization of our firms, same thing happened. We were at 30%, we are at 15%. So it's clear that there is a shrinking of what, uh, in terms of uh, big economic figures, Europe represents in the world, but we are still an unavoidable actor because we have a strong engagement through our policies of cooperation and through our policies of trade. Trade, I want to illustrate that with this image. If you ask who is the first trade partner, only two, China and US, and you compare 80 with 2018, you see how much China has been taking the lead. You compare only China and US. But there are a third actor, which is the European Union. And then instead of two colors, you use three colors, then it's not so clear, because the European Union also exists, and we play an important role in Africa still, and over the equator and in the south, we play an important role in India, we play an important role in the Middle East. But look, in Latin America today, the first trade partner is no longer Europe. It's everywhere China. All Latin American countries trade more than China than with anyone else. That's not true for Africa. For Africa, we still play a role in, uh, in India, in the Middle East, but it's clear that the expansion of uh, the China as a trade power has a long-term long -term trend and consequences.
And here the question is, uh, is the globalization slowing? This uh, is globalization, globalization is globalization. Well, it, it looks like because it started uh, growing, 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 and the, for the first time, it has been decreasing. Not a lot, but does it mean a trend or is it just an accident? We don't know. But uh, one thing is clear, is that more and more, the trade is being done among countries of the same continent. The trade is being done among regions, global, not the whole world, but regions. The regional trade is growing, the global trade is decreasing. And this is part of the big rift between EU and US. EU and US, I'm not talking about China, I'm talking the view US, over the green industry and jobs. This is the matter of today. Yesterday, President von der Leyen gave a speech at, De uh, at Davos, he is my president, President von der Leyen, talking about the competition between EU and US, and talking about how do we manage it. One solution could be to let every country to give state aid. But look, since the beginning of the pandemic, this is Germany, this is France. The two of them represent 75% of the whole amount of the state aid of the European industry. And let me try to summarize in a couple of sentences what it's about. The ERA, the tool that uh, President Biden has proposed in order to fight against inflation, has little to do about fighting inflation. What is behind it is uh, $350,000 million on subsidies. It's a big push to subsidies. It will have not a lot of influence on inflation. It's a good word to use to fight against inflation because everybody is in favor of fighting against inflation. But it is a job creation machine by giving subsidies to American firms, excluding other firms, and on my understanding, against the rule of WTO. And when we go and complain and we say, well, you should not do it because you are creating a competitive gap, against us, the Americans answer, do you the same thing? We don't matter, we don't care. We subsidize them, do it, subsidize you too. Well, if the world goes in a competition who, who subsidizes more, then forget about globalization, or forget about uh, global exchanges, we go back the old times of competition through subsidies. But there is a big difference between the US and the European Union. The US is a federation, it's a political entity. So the federation, the federal power, Washington, have the monetary power and can give subsidies to the whole of the American economy. We are not a federation. We are not a political unity. And in Brussels, they don't have, we don't have the same capacity than US to provide subsidies to the whole European economy. And if we let it be done member state by member state, then we are going to fragment the internal market because the most powerful countries will be better placed to support more their own industries and then the competition, the fair competition, that tries to avoid subsidies is over. So we cannot do like our American friends do, because we are not a political entity and we are not going to be tomorrow. Anyway, our answer to this uh, pandemic has been impressive. We broke a taboo, and now we have a strong discussion with the US about how do we react to these decisions that represents also the end of the story started in the year 2000. On 2000, the Western world pushed for China becoming member of the WTO because we believe that trade 
will make political changes in China. It will be an evolution towards a multi-party political system as us. This has not happened, and it will not happen. By the contrary, we are now going to this confrontation based on technology and based on uh, industrial capacities. And this will mark the future of the world. The important thing is where we will be, the Americans and the Europeans. Certainly, Europe will always be closer to Washington than to China. We share the same political system and the same economic system, free market and multi-party competition. But we have our own interest. We look at the world with different eyes in some cases. So I think that in this competition, Europe has to have its own capacity to decide its own policy, especially if the US takes measures that affect the competitivity of our firms. The way in which we will respond in a coordinated manner, or again, in a confrontational manner, will determine not only the growth of the world economy, but the way the power, the political power, will be distributed. So you have in front of you a fantastic scenario for the scholars to work, to think, to make, uh, uh, to think about what's going to happen. And you have the chance of being in one of the best academic centers to study how the world is and how the world could be. And nobody knows how it will be because it will depend on a lot of political decisions that maybe you will have the opportunity to participate on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Burrell, for your wise words and for this enlightening analysis about the current world situation. Now we will enjoy a panel of incredible professionals about rethinking global affairs to confront these global challenges that Burrell was addressing. And it will be moderated by Augusto Lopez Claros, Chair of the Global Governance Forum. The panel will be formed by Jody Williams, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, and foreign, uh, former President of the United Nations General Assembly, and Susana Malcorra, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, and former Chief of Staff of the United Nations Secretary General. Please welcome them on stage. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think you will agree with me that we are privileged to have these three distinguished uh, uh, ladies with us. Uh, I think among them they have probably more than 100 years of relevant experience in public policy and in a number of very important areas. Um, Maria Fernanda and I were in New York in uh, last September during the General Assembly Week. We participated in a panel at the Global Futures Conference. And I think probably you will agree with me that we sense a, a growing sense of alarm about what is happening in the world. Since then, we have seen the United Nations Development Program issue a report ahead of COP27, saying essentially that there is no viable path to the one and a half degree um, temperature threshold that was established at the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, I could spend a lot of time now making a list of all the challenges that we face in the, in the coming years. I will not do that. We are a little bit squeezed for time at the moment. Um, Susanna, let's begin with you. 
Um, COVID-19, as you know, in 2020 has disrupted in many ways, not only the economy, but our global order in very important ways. I think one of the interesting slides of Mr. Borrell's presentation was basically to suggest that the first, the most important goal of the sustainable development framework, the elimination of extreme poverty by 2030, is out of reach. We're not going to do that. We're not going to be able to achieve that. We have seen, of course, the way in which COVID has also enhanced, worsened income inequality. Um, uh, there was a report soon after the outbreak of COVID from the International Labor Organization saying that um, you know, 1.7 billion people in the informal economy had seen their income drop by 80%. So, um, Susanna, what are some of the lessons that are coming out of, of this crisis of COVID? And not just in terms of the implications for the economic system, but also you know, the broader implications for international cooperation. Well, the first lesson is that we were not prepared for it. Yeah. And it's not for lack of warning. It was clearly stated that this was going to happen, and by the way, it's going to happen again. So leaders did not pay attention to it. The notion of immediacy of the problem of today it really it show a total lack of focus on preparedness. The second is that the pandemic is by nature global. In fact, some people use say global pandemic is redundant. The pandemic is global. But we tackle it with very localized solutions. So that not only is low the solution of the pandemic, getting out of the pandemic, but it created a big tension between North and South because of the lack of empathy and sympathy for what was happening in the South. And again, it delayed the solution of the pandemic. The third is that the pandemic, a, a health pandemic, is not a health issue. It's a multiple factors issue. Uh, yes, it is health, and at the beginning it was clearly health, but the intertwined problems that the pandemic created, economic, social, political, are so big that they need a multifaceted solution. And for that, I would say, the multilateral system was not up to it. WHO is part of the solution, but cannot tackle the solution. You need the, the Bretton Woods institutions, you need the regional banks, you need a much more comprehensive solution, and I think that's something we need to learn. We need to put a crisis response model that is able to tackle the, the pandemics to come. And the third is exactly that. Are we going to commit to solutions that can address future, future pandemics? You know, everybody is now talking about this pandemic uh, pact. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the, of, of the process. I very much doubt that member states will adhere to the very, very challenging commitments that should come with such a pact. So it, it's not binding, it's not useful. Again, pandemic show, the COVID show, that a global tackling of the problems is absolutely necessary, that we need to step up to it, and that against all odds, against the undercurrents that we have today, we need to reinforce those global responses, and we need to commit to solutions that go beyond the local, the national, and the regional. Otherwise, we will not be able to solve what is coming our way very soon. Thank you, Susanna. Jody, building, building up a little bit upon something that Susanna said, it seems to me that one of the, one of the problems that we, we have sort of confronted with the pandemic is what I would call a kind of a lack of good priorities in terms of public spending. You know, we spend too much money uh, uh, subsidizing energy, we spend vast resources building up our military establishments, you know, defense and so on. Um, we have a notion of national security that is sort of unduly focused on, on uh, sort of the military, military preparedness, weapons and so on. Now, you have written a lot about the concept of human security. Uh, something that presumably is more linked to human welfare rather than just, you know, the military. If you could just elaborate a little bit for us this concept of human security. Sure. 
uh, pleasure. Human security, as you just said, um, focuses on the security of human beings. National security focuses on the security of the state apparatus, right? And under the national security framework, it is implied that, you know, if the apparatus of the state is, is secure, its citizens are secure which is absurd if you look at many of the countries in the world that have big military budgets relative to their resources and the degrees of poverty in those countries. It's ridiculous. I'll, I'll use my own, um, the US. A couple of years ago I did a piece and I was looking at the um, discretionary budget of the US. I think it was in 2020. More than 57 percent of the discretionary budget of my country went to the military. 57 percent. I think it was 3 percent that went to education, 3 percent that went to health, 3 percent that went to the State Department. Now, all you have to do is look at a country's budget and how they spend their money to see what their priorities are and if their priorities are actually dealing with the needs of their people. Recent studies have shown that you know, people around the world are very disturbed by what's happening in the world. Of course, climate change is freaking everybody out. Well, probably not if you own BP or Exxon or one of those fun companies, but the normal human beings are freaked out. Um, they're freaked out about the disparity of wealth. I'm freaked out that a handful of multi-billionaires control more resources than most of the world. Um, we need to stop looking at the world through the lens of how many weapons can we have to make us safe. It, I gotta look at that, oh God, I'll keep talking. Um, do we feel safe today with Russia threatening to use nukes? I know I don't. I grew up with the nuclear generation and hiding under my desk in grade school to learn how to save me from a direct nuclear attack. Insane, it's insane. We need to focus on what makes a dignified life, a healthy life, uh, jobs that make people feel like they're contributing to society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and saving our planet. That's human security. Maria Fernanda, you have been uh, very active and have been a strong voice in the, in the climate change debate and sort of the environmental discourse with emissions uh, rising since 2015, you know, the Paris Agreement, and our scientists increasingly alarmed about the lack of a viable path, you know, to bring emissions down. You know, what are your main concerns? And in particular, you know, how can we strengthen the implementation of the commitments that were made by countries in, in 2015, number one? And how can we also shift the focus to the intergenerational dimension of climate change. You look at the audience here, you know, many of, of these are young women and men. They will bear the brunt of our inaction, our, our irresponsibility. Well, first of all, thank you to IE University and the Global Governance Forum. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great space. We started high. With, with Mr. Borrell, and, and here we are discussing key issues such as climate change. And I often say that climate change is not a problem, it's a symptom. It's like when we, you have a fever. The fever is not the illness, and what is happening is that climate change is a symptom of a dysfunctional relationship between our economies, our political systems, in our production and consumption patterns. Why is it so difficult? We have the knowledge, we have the technologies, we, we know 
what we have to do. But what we have to do is challenging our own lifestyles. What we have to do is challenging the power structures that we have, the power of some companies, uh, corporate power, you mentioned a name, but we can cite many, many names uh, as well. So that's why after 27 conference of the parties, quasi 28 times, we have met as an international community to take decisions on how to curb emissions. And yet we are where we are. Emissions continue to grow what to do, and, and, and I think here there is an intergenerational responsibility. We have the frameworks in place, and what we need is both uh, a civilizational uh, shift in terms of values, in terms of thinking about the future, in terms of new political leadership that is responsible. Uh, we need a reconciliation with nature. We, we need a new pact of love with, with nature in a way. And uh, basically we are seeing at the normative level some interesting developments. Um, uh, um, an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice on climate responsibility. We have seen legal rulings in Germany, in New Zealand, in Ecuador, uh, at the constitutional level, at the high courts level, on the state responsibility on the climate crisis. And, and here again, um, when we heard inequalities are growing, poverty, extreme poverty in particular, uh, is, is growing, that also translates into the climate discourse. Why? Because the highest price of the climate catastrophe is being paid by the smallest countries, but by the small island developing states. We came up last COP with a loss and damage fund. The, the loss and damage fund is empty. It's an empty box. We need to really make uh, the decisions to finance and to fund climate resilience and climate adaptation in the Global South countries. I don't like very much the Global South, but let's say the developing low and middle income uh, countries. It's a political decision. We need the political will and the intergenerational responsibility to make it happen. But we have to make some concessions on our own lifestyles. And when, when I say uh, own lifestyle, we, I talk about the wealthiest, the elites, and what J Jody was mentioning, you know, that you are uh, scared to death looking at how um, the, um, uh, the very few own the majority of wealth and power in our world. So climate is about power, climate is about lifestyles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maria, um, let me shift gears a little bit, um, come to you, Susana. And uh, um, I was thinking about some of the comments made by Mr. Borella in his uh, presentation. And uh, one question which I'd like to pose to you is whether the European Union, um, you know, with its uh, history, you know, going from six nations reducing trade barriers in 1957 to 27 nations today, having built up a huge institutional infrastructure you know, to support economic and political integration. I'm thinking about the, the Commission, the European Court of Justice, the Parliament, the Central Bank, and so on. Is that a potential template that we could use for international cooperation in the future in other parts of the world? Well, first of all, I, I think the European Union is one of the greatest creation of humankind, particularly because it came after two world wars and, and, and these countries fighting and losing so many uh, resources, human material resources and, 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 and the moral being so, so, so low. I think it's hard to think that this will replicate as such in the rest of the world. There are cultural differences. Some will argue that it takes two world wars to get there, you know, and so it, 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 it's hard to, to predict a model that is based on, on such an assumption. Uh, I think that we clearly need 
to rethink the global structure we have, the global governance we have. Clearly, the different regions need to come together better, particularly my region, our region, needs to do something about it. But whatever we have to do from here on, and, and I started with, with COVID showing how much that is needed, it will be done in, a, in an environment that is essentially counter to the notion of integration. You know, is, there is a, an undercurrent in, at this moment throughout the world of a globalization being a bad word. And by the way, many things that globalization took were not good. So if we are to think about globalization to the future, it has to be 2.0. Many things need to, to be revisited. But the notion of isolation that is now permeating in the minds of many citizens, that is creating this reaction to, to integrating, that is creating these hyper-nationalistic perspectives, that is it, giving the sense that hunkering down is the way to go, is the baseline from which we will have to reconstruct a new governance system. So what I will argue is that we are facing a huge challenge here, and only very enlightened people that understand that the global public goods are essential for the good of their own people will be able to put it together. It's a message that is counter to what resonates in many years these days. Politicians need to understand it, and need to realize that sometimes you cannot be a follower of what social media says. You have to be a leader of your own people in order to make the changes that are needed. Thank you, Anna. Um, Jordi, um, in 1968, the United States and the Soviet Union negotiated the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. And eventually, they got persuaded 190 other countries to, to join them. And it is one of the most comprehensive treaties, which incidentally calls for uh, not only eliminating the nuclear weapons, but you know, in putting in place a process of disarmament. Right? Now, recently, you wrote an article uh, for the Global Governance Forum uh, uh, website, in which you said the following, and I will quote, this is really very, very important. She said, instead of, a free, uh, instead of a world free of the terror of nuclear weapons, we continue to naively believe that the world is made secure through nuclear deterrence. A blind belief in such a deterrence as a security policy has brought us to where we are today facing Russian President Putin's threats to use them. This is a tough question for you, especially given the time constraint. How can we sort of bring ourselves back to the negotiating table to reverse some of these very perturbing trends? I wish political satire were allowed at the moment, but <laughs> I'm supposed to be serious. Um, that is an $82.4 billion question. That is how much money the nine nuclear states spent in 2021 on their weapons. 82.4 billion. Um, when I wrote that piece, uh, a version of it appeared in Houston, Texas uh, Chronicle. I received an email from a military fellow who asked if I was um, delusional in a polite way about Putin and his threats. And, you know, if I wanted to really change the world on this, I needed to lay out a plan of action. If I could lay out a plan of action that would be followed, I'd be the empress of the world <laughs> or the empress of the universe. I think we need to use those levers uh, to put pressure on governments who I won't say pretend, but who put forth an image of being, you know, a women-centered foreign policy or, you know, a humanitarian neutral country uh, and make them actually walk the talk. Yesterday in Geneva, um, 
a new effort was launched and it is called the Peacemaking Covenant. And it is based on um, eight peacemaking principles. I won't go into them because I don't have time. The states that were sponsoring it are Switzerland, Sweden, Germany, the Netherlands, and Denmark. They did two years of consultation with NGOs and international bodies, etc., to develop this covenant. And as I was thinking about it, and your question, I was thinking, wait a minute, how do these countries, which are producers and exporters of weapons of war, get off on promoting the peacemaking covenant, the peace making principles. If we really want to change this world, we have to pressure everybody who makes weapons. Not just the nuclear, but of course, since, you know, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, I've wanted them gone. Um, but it won't happen if civil society doesn't get up and take action to pressure governments so they believe that we really care to get rid of the weapons. You know, the countries, oh, I have to stop. Sorry, people, I could go on. Um, she, my panelists are under a very strict order to limit their responses to three minutes. And you can see that I have been very effective in my role as moderator. She stopped in the middle of a sentence, right? We self-destruct if we don't shut up. All right. Um, Maria Fernanda, um, three minutes or less. Um, in 2020, the United Nations uh, commemorated the 75th anniversary of the signing or the adoption of the UN Charter. There were multiple events, uh, consultations, uh, you know, open fora, uh, town meetings, and so on. Um, thinking and soul-searching about the future of the United Nations. Um, briefly tell us to what extent those, those events, you know, manage to give us a, a vision of where we want the United Nations to be on the 100th anniversary in 2045. And, uh, and uh, you know, how do we turn this uh, organization, which was born against the background of 60 million fatalities in World War II, into a problem-solving organization? Problem-solving organization. Coming back to the 75th anniversary, you know, a little anecdote. I was the president of the General Assembly at the time, and I said, we need something big for the 75th anniversary. Well, my idea wasn't very popular at the beginning, and they say, one more commemoration, you know, people didn't see why and how, no? But we were able to agree on a process and on a resolution to commemorate the 75th anniversary. We did not want to organize a party, an anniversary party, but we did want, that was the intention, to unleash a global conversation about the future of the UN but not only within the UN premises, but the world, especially young thinkers, young change makers, women, scientists. And I think it did happen in many ways. And uh, that gave birth to what we have today, which I think it's a very ambitious, forward-looking UN 75 political declaration that at the time also um, gave a mandate to the Secretary General to produce a roadmap for the reform of the UN in the long run, which is the Our Common Agenda report. And I mention the process because sometimes process is as important as content. The Our Common Agenda report, even if not perfect, I think it's, it's a blueprint, it's, it's a pathway to look at the future of the United Nations beyond the walls of the United Nations, beyond New York. And that's the purpose. In March, 21st and 22nd, I'm, I'm doing a little ad here, but we have the Global People's Forum, uh, perhaps the biggest global conversation on the future of, of the UN. Um, in 2024, we are preparing for a big summit of the future, precisely to bring audacious, creative, 
uh, retooling ideas for the United Nations. A new agenda for peace is in the making as we, as we speak. A new gender architecture for the organization. Uh, the way the institution organizes itself in the 21st century to respond, for example, to the digital revolution and how, how to go about it. Uh, how to decide and discuss uh, regulations for social media, for example in how to tackle the 34, I think, active armed conflicts around the world. We continue to speak about Ukraine, and of course, we are all worried about Ukraine and what is happening, but, but there are more than 30 armed conflicts right now in the world where there are different levels of engagement of the international community. We have the situation of women in Iran and Afghanistan. So the world is in turmoil, but the solution cannot come from a institution. I was often asked why the UN doesn't do this or that, or why the, the UN doesn't respond to this and that. The answer is we are the UN, and these are not only words. We, the people's part of the UN Charter. So we all have a voice, we all have a say. The only thing is that we need a collective and shared plan. We need the strategy, we need the tactics, we need the narrative, and we need to know that we are part of this big challenge. And I think we are living a special moment of reinvention. I'm optimist, and I think that if we don't get our act together here and now, we're going to be in big trouble of legitimacy, of accountability, and of performance of the multilateral system as a whole. The kind of conflicts that we're facing, you know, this sort of array of global catastrophic risks which threaten the future of humanity. And again, I'm looking at the audience and the, the young people in front of us. Um, raises questions about the kind of leadership that we need in, in today's world, you know, to confront these, these global challenges. And so my question to you is, is it has two parts to it. Tell us briefly, what are the defining characteristics of good leadership in the 21st century in the face of, this, of these risks, number one? And number two, and I hate to put you on the spot, but I will. Um, it's an important occasion, so I'll take that, uh, that prerogative. Um, we have 193 uh, uh, prime ministers, heads of state, you know, corresponding to the 193 members of the United Nations. Uh, do many of them have what it takes? <laughs> well, you don't put me in the, on the spot. I think that's the right question, particularly when we face young people like we do today. By the way, that's the hope we have, you know, that what makes us think that there is a future there. Uh, we as a generation have failed to them, clearly. All the indicators show that. Um, first of all, I believe that Power needs to reflect society. And we are not there, clearly. Uh, when we see the profile of the leaders of the world, and this is not only polit in political terms, also in corporate terms, mm -hmm. we see that half of society is not represented there. Women are essentially missing. Among the 193 that you mentioned, there are only very few women, and by the way, we got up this morning, we woke up with a very, very bad news that Jacinda, the, the, foreign, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, is stepping down. You know, she was one of the highlights of leadership in the world. Throughout COVID in particular, she showed that. So the first question is how we make sure that the society is properly represented. And by saying that, I mean women being in, in, in the power game. Second, you need to read problems through different lenses, given the complexity of the problems. And you need a much more nuanced approach to problem solving. You need to tackle questions in terms of grace. And men are not well equipped to do that in general terms. Women are much more equipped to handle nuances. That's another reason why we need women, because of the complexity of the challenges we have. We need empathy, because 
putting yourselves in the other shoes is essential to tackling some of these problems. Again, not necessarily the best of characteristics in general terms for men. So my plea is here that we really make it happen. It will take, in, in, with the trend we have today, it will take until the next century to get to, to parity in the world. Every statistic show that. We need to be proactive. We need to shift dramatically the tools we use in order to increase women's participation. As president of GWL Voices that advocates for that, I cannot not say it here. And in doing so, created, create the, the pool of leaders that really will reflect on what society needs in terms of understanding, understanding society because they are a reflection of society. Thank, thank you, Susana. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to um, do a little bit of, of shift in choreography because I am under some instructions from our hosts about the end time of this panel. And so what I will do whether they like it or not, I'm on the stage, so they can't really move, remove me physically from it. And what we'll do is we'll collapse my, the last two questions into one, right? All right. Uh, but still subject to the same uh, time constraint. So, <laughs> so Jody, um, this, this question is a little bit provocative. Um, there was a, a, a famous professor from Johns Hopkins University a couple of decades ago who basically said major war will become obsolete soon enough in the 21st century. Basically because in a world that is interconnected and fully integrated, um, the costs of war become insurmountable. Insurmountable. Not only that, but, but of course as well, the, the utility of military, the military force the utility of violence is becoming increasingly ineffective, right? Look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, look at Ukraine today. You know, using force and killing people to achieve political ends seems to be a very futile end, right? So my question to you is, is peace inevitable in some sense? Will it, will it become, um, will it come as a result of um, conscious choice or you know, untold human suffering. Susanna said that it took two world wars to get Europe to where we are today. Is it going to take a third world war, you know, to get the world to where we are today, number one. And number two, the, the, the example that you have set for young people in the world with the work that you'd lead, you did leading to the land, landmines uh, treaty, you know, suggests the possibility of a very important role for the individual and for civil society in innovations in the area of international cooperation. Please tell some words of encouragement to these young people so that they can look at the future with some hope, you know, mm -hmm. that this is not now going to end in some kind of huge calamity associated with climate change or some other, some other risks. Or the nuclear weapons and Mr. Putin and some of the other, the other people. Um, whether or not peace is inevitable, I have no idea. If we look at what keeps happening in the world, um, war and violence is still a very popular thing. Um, I think the reason, one of the many reasons that uh, wars continue to happen is because there is a marriage, if you will, between governments, departments of defense, universities that provide research for weapons making, now the marriage of artificial intelligence and weapons where weapons on their own will be able to select and kill a target. So there won't be human beings involved in that decision, which is totally mind-boggling, totally immoral, totally unethical, and yet gajillions of dollars are being spent on those weapons, and some of them are being tested in the war in Ukraine. 
So what will it take to make peace inve inevitable? Is people caring enough to participate in bringing about positive change? And that does not mean you have to love everybody in the world. There's business about love, love, love. And I don't like most people, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, I rarely invite people to my house for dinner and to spend the night, forget about it. <laughs> but we are all part of the so-called human family. And if we don't think about we can do it egotistically. I want peace because it'll do something for me. Cool if it helps other people, but I really want it to help me. But that takes choice, takes decision making every single day about what you are, who you are, what you want to be, and how you're going to move forward to make a contribution. You don't have to be a full-time activist. People think, you know, if, I, if I'm not a full-time activist, I can't do this, you know, I can't participate. That's ridiculous. There are millions of ways to participate, and if I had time, I would give you a few examples of participation in the landmine campaign that were rocking it, man. They were unbelievable, and these were not full-time activists. Whatever, um, whatever makes you the most irritated, find an organization working on resolving that irritating issue and volunteer. I started as a volunteer. I was a full-time teacher. I started volunteering on El Salvador. Uh, a jillion years later, I made my parents happy with the Nobel Peace Prize. Neither of them finished high school, so it was, I am going to take a couple seconds, because um, I shut myself up earlier. I'm going to Nobel name drop. Two of my closest male Nobel friends uh, are His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu, who died last year. Um, and each of them individually on different occasions, different forums, said, uh, men have ruined this planet for millennia. It is about time that men step aside and let women clean up the mess. Absolutely. Uh, as the only man on this panel, <laughs> I fully, 100% agree. We have made a mess of this world. Maria, the last question to you. All right. Cord Mayer was a young man in his 20s, and he was a member of the American delegation to the, to the 1945 conference where the charter was adopted. He was a veteran. He had lost an eye uh, in the battles in Europe. And he wrote the following in a very insightful article in the Atlantic in 1945. He said, a major power can violate every principle and purpose set forth in the charter and yet remain a member of the organization by the lawful use of the veto power expressly granted into it. Uh, you know, it seems like a very pertinent description of Russia today, right? So my question is, is the veto the original sin of the United Nations? Will the veto ultimately doom the United Nations into irrelevance? Or can we strengthen the organization and improve its effectiveness, perhaps by limiting its use or by some other artful legal maneuver? Well, I, I think that we all agree that the veto power is undemocratic and has caused many problems. No? Uh, and uh, there, are, there is more and more traction among the P5 members that there is a need to transform the way the, the Security Council does business. Uh, and, uh, and I think that this sentiment is growing because uh, they see that they can run against them 
you know, at some point. Uh, but uh, sometimes people focus on the veto issue. Mm -hmm. I think that the retooling, the rejuvenation of the United Nations is a, is a bigger enterprise. The veto is one right exclusive to the P5 um, in the Security Council world, but the organization is much bigger. And I think that when we look at a reform process, as a structural reform process, we have to look at all the bits and pieces. The Our Common Agenda allows for that. Uh, and, and by the way, there was a historical resolution that passed in the General Assembly, which for me is the most powerful body of the United Nations, is the parliament where everybody has the same button to vote, the same microphone to speak, and the same power, regardless of square kilometers or, or GDP. That's where the democracy uh, of the United Nations uh, needs to happen. And that's why a reform process of the General Assembly is also uh, much, much needed. And there are three things. Let me just close with three, uh, three ideas. The issue of, of performance. Uh, I think one of the biggest deficits of the UN, of the multilateral system, is the one on uh, delivery, performance, and compliance. And we need to come with a system that allows for that. Deeds and not words. People get tired of hundreds of resolutions that get passed and are not complied with. Number two, the issue of the decision-making processes. What is consensus? And, and believe me, I have used that. Consensus is not unanimity. You know, it's a larger majority that is acting on behalf of humanity in a way. And these kinds of categories of decision making need to really make a big stride when we're thinking about overall reform. And the last, it's not the only one, but we need a new definition of sovereignty, of national sovereignty and national interest, no? Uh, in, with regard to our collective well-being, our collective security, our common goods. What, what are we doing with our commons, including a stable climate, including outer space, including our oceans, etc., etc. So these are the fundamental things that need to happen. You know, uh, these are the issues. We have now the raw material and the political momentum, I'm sorry, uh, and the political momentum to make it happen. Uh, but it's not going to happen indoors at the UN, as mentioned. So we are here because we are the we, the people's part of the system. And we need the creativity, the intelligence, the audacity of young scholars like you are. And uh, so uh, I think it is time now. Uh, just join uh, this, the Global People's uh, Futures Forum in March. Be connected and tuned to the preparation of the Summit of the Future in 2024. There, there, the space is there. The traction is there. The political atmosphere is there. So it's now or never. That, that's my opinion. It's now or never. Friends, um, I think I speak on behalf of Maria, Susana, and Jody in first of all thanking the organizers for giving us the honor of being present on the first day of the new School of Polit Politics, Economics and Global Affairs at this institution. I hope you will agree with me that the issues that we have discussed today in a somewhat more compressed fashion than anticipated um, have, are highly relevant not just for the future of global governance but also for the kinds of issues that you, as a students at this great university, will be contemplating and studying and analyzing in coming months and in coming years. We, all four of us, wish you well, and thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much to the panelists for such a great exchange of ideas and such a fascinating panel. And thank you especially for inspiring us to be persistent and proactive in wanting to leave a positive legacy in this world. Nelson Mandela famously said, education is the most powerful tool you can use to change the world. We are certain that here at the IE School of Politics, Economics and Global Affairs, students will get the education that they need to become change makers, not only in the future, but also now.
Thank you very much to everyone who made the event possible. And thank you all of you for being here with us today on such an important day for IE. Um, it went well. I, please join us in the cocktail outside on the foyer as soon as you exit the auditorium. Thank you very much. Thank you all. That was really good.